Jim had asked me to sculpt my dogs. This is something he does for a number of artists, a number of painters, and other, other people in the miniatures industry. And during the time I was sculpting it, my oldest dog, Tiger Lee, passed away. I had a little problem finishing the project. And so we went a little bit longer than we wanted to, but I finally got it done. And Jim handed it out last year at ReaperCon. He uh, called me up one day and said, you know, we ought to really do a uh, medallion for this contest I'm going to have. And I thought, it's one miniature of one little pug. I don't think I want to sculpt an entire medallion. You don't want to pay for it to be cast for just one or two entries. <laughs> and he kept arguing with me. He said, look, I, I handed them out for free. There'll be at least four people at it. <laughs> so we had... 55. 55 people. <laughs> Pugs and thugs, baby. It's time to paint some tiger lily. All right. So, uh, as stated, Jim from Dark Sword handed out tiger lily last year at ReaperCon, and my plan was to um, have this whole thing on our Patreon miniature monthly Discord server where everyone could paint their pug, and we'd all talk about it, and we'd all help each other out, and um, and we just have all these tiger lilies there at ReaperCon. Um, didn't quite work out the way I wanted it to. I literally started painting Tiger Lily two days before having to leave for, for uh, ReaperCon. So um, yes, this was a little bit rushed, but I thought, hey, why don't I film the whole thing and then maybe I could do my dark lining video with it and maybe some other stuff. Um, so that's what ended up happening. But I wanted to put th together this sort of fast forward compilation just so you could see the whole process of painting Tiger Lily from start to finish, uh, however rushed it may have been. Um, I think it came out pretty cool in the end. So uh, as always, I start off with uh, wet blending. Um, this is my standard meet in the middle technique and I'm always just doing sort of general lighting on the figure at first. Um, but it does give me a little bit of a, of a brief uh, glimpse of what the figure will look like at the end. Um, usually I use my mid-tone color and a shadow color. Not so much the highlights or anything because I just want to get sort of that general look of the figure um, and I want to see how the whole thing looks together at the end. You may also notice that I really do use the same colors all the way throughout the model. Um, so like on Tiger Lily's little skirt here, I'm going for like a whitish tan kind of color. Um, and But you'll also notice that I do the same exact color combination on the fur of Tiger Lily. And uh, it just looks a little bit different because I use different amounts of black and white um, in the mix. And also the Baylor Brown. So uh, I like doing this. It keeps the colors um, uh, sort of... Uh, so they all work together and they all play nicely together. Um, and it keeps me from having any weird, like sort of uh, nasty color combos in the end. Another thing I did here on Tiger Lily, since since I wasn't real sure on how I wanted to do the fur, um, I decided very early on to uh, base coat it and then start detailing it right away. So I kind of broke my normal mantra of doing all the base coating, base coating the entire model right off the bat. And I sort of stopped in the middle and started painting um, more of the texture and stuff on the fur and uh, just kind of getting that face to where I wanted it. I also knew that this was going to be the longest portion of the paint job um, and most difficult probably because of all the fur and so I wanted to do that kind of early on in the paint process so that I could get it out of the way and the rest of the paint job would would be a little smoother and you see I just kind of jumped back and forth with my highlights shadows um, I also added a little uh, pinkish tones uh, to Tiger Lily's uh, mouth and muzzle area um, and this is because basically my sister has a dog uh, Maddie who has a very pink tones there and around her mouth and so I wanted to do something similar with Tiger Lily here and uh, also it gave another tone to the face it wasn't just all the shades of gray um, there was a little bit of saturation there and it kind of drew you into the the middle section of the face And the fur was just hours of 
putting tiny little furs down. And if you want to know what it takes um, to do higher end paint jobs, um, this is one of the things. Um, had I had more time, I would have put even more effort into the fur. It just that the, all your time should be spent in the details. Um, and that's why I always try to make my base coating go as quickly as possible. It is literally all about the, the details. So her little cape or shawl thing here, whatever it is, I wasn't really sure what color to do it. So in the end, I was just like, you know what? We got a bunch of Namatal gold stuff that's going to be on this figure. Let's make it a golden shade. So just kind of wet blend it in real quick um, with some, some goldish kind of colors. Um, that's just Baylor Brown. And then the shadow is Baylor Brown mixed with black. So very simple, kind of wet blend it in. And boom, the, the, the cape shaw thing is base coated. Um, then just using sort of the same colors, jump into the non-metallic metal on her staff. Um, the staff, I wasn't real sure exactly what I wanted to do with the staff, but I knew that there was going to be obviously metallic uh, colors in it. So I went with non-metallic gold and non-metallic silver. Um, and since my lighting is coming from the right hand side or the left side here on the video, um, I made sure that all my highlights and stuff uh, reflected towards that side of, of the miniature so that everything, all my lighting was consistent. Um, you also notice I added a little bit of red there on the staff itself and that is basically from her uh, dress or tunic um, reflecting on the metallics there. It's always fun to like, add little reflections like that. And here you can see I'm using saturated color to really make that gold stand out. It was like almost pure Baylor Brown there. Um, and I just mixed it with my shadows where Baylor Brown mixed with black. So it's very desaturated. And then the areas where it was just straight Baylor Brown, it was very saturated and it shows up really well. I've been pushing for a long time to really the 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 benefits of saturated color and how it shows up so much better in your paint jobs. Um, play around with it a little bit in your own paint jobs, like adding more saturation. Like here's a perfect example in these in the leather. Um, I'm using saturated color over a very uh, or saturated brown over a very desaturated brown base coat. Um, I'm using Mornfang brown and then I'm adding Baylor brown to that, which is more of an ochre color. So I'm using orangish tones in my brown and also yellowish tones to make the leather straps really uh, stand out like make all the little highlights stand out really well if I just used like white or a very light cream color um, I would have time I would have problems with you being able to see um, what I've painted on there so the saturated color even though it's in really really small spots it shows up better than almost anything else Once I got those detail, or once I've got the base coats on, I can start detailing the model. And this is the most fun. This is the part that I spend the most time on. Um, the base coat should take no longer than an hour, maybe two hours at the most, and then it's all details from there on out. Um, and here again, I'm doing the leathers, uh, building up color so that you can see parts better, um, adding some little details like the edging to her shoulder pads or shoulder armor or whatever the heck that is. Um, I decided to go with non-metallic gold um, just to kind of spruce it up a little bit. And I thought it would cool with the lighting effects shining off of that, those little gold stripes. Um, it would make it uh, look really nice uh, compared to the dark bluish gray, which is the background. I just keep coming back in, adding a little bit more highlighting, um, making sure all those highlights are uh, in line with my with my light source, um, which again is coming from the upper left hand corner. And then I wasn't really happy with the way the shoulder pads were, so I decided to do like a quilted um, pattern on them. Uh, I've done a lot of I've done some studio work for Dark Sword before, where uh, the the armor was like a quilted armor, and I thought that looked really cool. And so in this case, it's not sculpted on there, but I painted it to look like it's sculpted in to the to the shoulder pads itself. Um, just adding some extra highlights and. and um, uh, keeping those lines dark in between each one of the quilted squares um, makes it end up looking really cool and, and really kind of believable that those are actually sculpted in there. Yeah. 
And then I thought, you know, to add one last little thing, like maybe make some little gold buttons on each one of the square quilts. Um, so I did that and then started adding in all my details for the non-metallic metal. Um, if you notice, everything is still light on the left side of the model. Um, and uh, that keeps things consistent. You may also notice when I put my highlights in, I usually start in the center of the highlight. That's where my first brush strike goes. And that way, as my paintbrush runs out of paint, um, it, it fades away in either direction from that center point of the highlight. Um, so that gives me like a nice sparkling effect in the middle of my highlights. And you'll really see throughout this video, I go back over these non-metallic metal areas over and over again because I want to build up that set, the uh, the amount of color that I've got on there. I want to build up my opacity. Um, not so much going for lighter and lighter colors. I'm st I'm staying with more of a brighter, uh, saturated highlight there, and um, and I'm just adding more and more to that. Um, at the top of that part of the staff right there uh, I switched to a more of a pink color for the highlight um, because of the reflecting uh, tunic on the on the metal itself and this is my least favorite part well not quite yet my least favorite part um, <laughs> Right here you see me uh, highlighting the back of the model um, and you want to remember to pay just as much uh, attention and effort to the back of your model as you do the front. Um, maybe for like gaming purposes or something you wouldn't do as much on the back of the model because no one's looking at that. But for a competition type model you definitely want to pay just as much attention to the back as you do the front. Now here I'm building up some of my highlights um, and my saturation in the front of her little dress tunic thing. Um, and this will just add a little bit more detail to the front of it and just make things look a little bit nicer. I'm being careful though not to highlight too far because I want this to look like matte fabric as opposed to the areas that are metallic which are super shiny. So if you make everything shiny, everything's shiny and no one can tell whether you have uh, you know, different fabrics, if it's leather, if it's metal, if it's you know, fa you know, fabric, whatever. Um, you definitely need to uh, tell the story of the different elements in your model as well as you can. Now this was an interesting part. I couldn't really tell if that was a raised area that was supposed to have like some sort of different color like a border to it or something on the tunic. Um, but I decided to do it in non-metallic gold and um, there was nothing on the bottom of the tunic. So I continued that little stripe on all the way around the figure and I just made a like kind of a faux border. I put some dark lining in there so it actually looked like it was raised and not part or like it was actually sculpted in the model like that. But there is no... There's no little band around the model. And now for my least favorite part of the model is the dark lining. And this takes forever. I literally uh, trace the entire model. Um, but it's very important for uh, the visibility, for your eyes to be able to focus on things. Uh, you need direct separation of each element. And um, so certain dark lining I make darker and certain dark lining I make lighter depending on where it is on the model. But um, uh, just in a, with a combination of several brush strokes, I can get the entire model looking very, very in focus with dark, with dark lining. And after a little bit of airbrush glazing to kind of smooth in the colors, um, I go back through and I re-highlight some areas and, and kind of bump up my sparkle on my metals and stuff like that. Um, I, wanna, I want everything to be have very high contrast, so sometimes with the airbrushing I can knock down colors a little bit, but then I bring them right back up. Um, in the areas I want to be shiny. So in this case, on all the metallics, I'm adding that final little bling bling of, of highlights um, to different areas, um, just to give it like a way better look. Can also come in and add um, some final highlights to the leathers. Um, I tend to uh, do details to a certain extent, and then I, I 
uh, go on to other parts of the model. And then I come back after I've had a chance to look at everything together and reevaluate and make certain things brighter, certain things darker, whatever I need to do to adjust the model um, to make it look the way I want it to look. You've probably seen me highlight these areas three times now in the in the video. Um, I'm just constantly coming back. Like here's a perfect example on the shoes. Um, adding that saturated color, and the shoes are very dark. But if I add some saturated color in there, some oranges and brown and like yellowish tones, um, I can get those highlights on the boots to to show up really well. Just come back in constantly re dark lining areas now the the little shawl that she's wearing here um i wasn't sure what to do with that and i had seen a bunch of people painting like crazy freehand patterns on their 54 millimeter night models and stuff on uh, facebook lately and so i decided i'd give my hand at it um except this model is super teeny tiny so <laughs> it was a little bit harder than i had like had anticipated but um, it was a lot of fun it was a good practice for drawing little teeny tiny lines and getting them all you know fairly even um, went with sort of a box pattern um, and I actually took two or three different patterns offline and kind of combined them to make like one cool uh, pattern just kind of scratch it all in with black um, and constantly coming back with my gold color, with my Baylor Brown, and uh, you know, fixing areas that I messed up, um, which there were lots of those. Uh, and then just adding the final parts of the pattern into the little squares. So there's lots of little half circles, and then like this weird starburst thing in the center. If you notice, my paintbrush is, my, my touch is very, very light at this point. I don't want that paintbrush to spread out at all. Um, all these lines are very tiny and I can't have uh, a big fat line um, happening. So keep my brush strokes very, very light. Um, and that usually makes it look very tight as far as the, as far as the pattern goes. So I'd add a little bit of color or non-color here. Um, I added like a bluish gray and then white on top of that to get some white stripes, um, but they're cooler. Um, so that kind of contrasts against uh, her tunic and the warmer colors of the fur and all that stuff. So just like a little bit of difference there tonally. Um, and then I came back in, highlighted up all the gold areas. Um, kind of that also helped to crisp up the the, the paint job itself in the freehand. And for a long time, I didn't know what to do with the, with the egg on top of the staff. And uh, I heard about Michelle Farnsworth was doing a breast cancer awareness uh, competition thing, um, fundraiser at ReaperCon. And so I thought this is a perfect place to put some, some pink OSL or some magenta kind of OSL. And so I thought, what if that egg is kind of breaking open, kind of Game of Thrones style, and uh, there's a really bright uh, pinkish magenta light coming from inside. Um, and so that was what I wanted to do. So I painted the egg black, um, so there would be a good dark black background um, to work against, and uh, and then put my little uh, cracked egg parts in, and then added a little bit of titanium white with the airbrush, um, just kind of raising the, the uh, opacity of it 10% at a time, so it looked really cool. And, uh, and then I'll just spray my magenta ink on top of that. And uh, inks are very, very vibrant, so it is a very good uh, way to do your OSL. Um, spraying a little overspray onto the hair and stuff. You still see the detail that I put in underneath it. Um, and I can always add a little details on top. Like here, I'm just adding some bright spots in the OSL to make it look like there's you know some electrical energy or something inside the egg um, trying to blast its way out. And then I moved on to the eyes. Um, I always start with like a pinkish gray, work that up to a, a cool gray. Um, I learned that from my good buddy, uh, Kirill Konev, when he came out here to teach classes. Um, 
I'm just like you guys. I'm constantly learning. So, you know, trying to trying to learn new things all the time and, and better my craft. Um, anyways, he taught me how to do eyes, and I really like the look. It looks very natural and very uh, uh, alive with the pinkish tones at first. Um, I figured the tunic needed a little something more, so I added a little bit of freehand to that. Um, at this point, it was the day before I was leaving for ReaperCon, and so I was running out of time, and my decision-making process was happening very fast. <laughs> um, it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon before I even started on the base, uh, so I had to get that putty on there, and I knew that the putty was not going to have time to dry. So I literally, normally I would do like this base layer, and then I'd do the sand right here the next day, and I'd do rocks maybe the next day, you know, I'd just sort of spread it out so I could have, each element would have time to dry. But in this case, I had to do it all wet on wet, so I had to be very careful not to, um, to mess up and get thumbprints in my, in my putty work. Um, so at this point, it's it's probably about six o'clock in the evening. Um, putting in uh, some texture, all that stuff. Uh, smoosh the model on. You can actually see it pushing down the putty, and then just sculpting right over the model's base itself, so that everything looked like it's within the rocks. Um, so it was a uh, it was a little bit tight, a little bit uh, anxiousness there, but um, but I got it all sculpted, and I'm literally just started painting right away. So this putty is all wet. I'm just <laughs> hitting it real light <laughs> with my paintbrush so there's not to move anything or whatever and uh, so I got wet putty I got wet paint I'm wet blending it's crazy so uh, this was this was a lot of fun though this is what contest painting is all about you know getting stuff done at the last minute like racing to to get it all done and trying to remember to do you know uh, do the once overs and make sure everything's super tight as far as the paint job went and everything so uh, one fun fact on this one, I actually used a greenish, uh, greenish gray on the highlights of this model. Um, and that actually ended up showing up a lot better than I thought it would. And so I, I think that the, the saturation uh, of that little bit of green and yellow in, in um, my highlight color there um, helped it to show up a little bit better and make those highlights pop. Notice I keep I'm keeping all those highlights um, off to the the left side of the model, you know where my light source came from. So all the way through the paint job, I'm always making sure that my lighting is consistent. Do a little washing with some two brush blending. Got to really be careful here because that that putty was setting up, but it still wasn't dry yet. So had to be really careful not to uh, wreck some of the work that I'd already done. In fact, there was a few times when I had to get my sculpting tool out and kind of smush in some thumbprints that I had made while I was painting. And then one of the last steps is just putting in a little flock grass. Um, I make sure to put in different colors um, and uh, trim it, you know, just like trimming your lawn. Um, <laughs> and uh, and then, you know, as always, there's always that one piece that just won't stick, you know, like the super glue is sticking to my, my tool there. And oh my gosh, that was so frustrating. It's frustrating now just, just even looking at it. <laughs> but it finally went on, so we're good to go. Give the base a quick paint, make that all black, nice, uh, good presentation at the end. Add some final, final details. I think I wanted to bump up my OSL just a little bit more and then where it was shining on the armor. And uh, just get those last final reflections in there before I call it a day. And uh, well, I didn't actually go to bed. I just finished the model and got on the plane. <laughs> so literally painted all night to get this done. Do some final little highlights on the gold just to reinforce where my light source is coming from. It's right there at the bottom. Bam. Super fun stuff. If you're ever looking for really cool like animal style uh, uh, sculpts, uh, Dark Sword definitely has some of the best in the industry. Um, they literally have hundreds of them, all different kinds of animals. 
super fun to paint. All right, first place for Tiger Lily Anthropug is going to go to Aaron Lovejoy. Oh, yeah.